It's been a while since I did Attack on Titan, so I might as well do another weird, obscure... What the hell? Heh, <laughs> Star Wars. Hey guys, this is my review for Monster Hunter. This movie was originally released in theaters back in January, and... Well, look how well that did. And unfortunately, there was no theaters for me to see it in, because this actually was a movie I wanted to see for all the wrong reasons. If you remember my buddy Pedram, he and I reviewed all of the Resident Evil films together. Because guess what? No! Oh, the gun's up, the gun's up in the air. He's dead! No, he's dead. What could he do? No, no, he's been shot like seven times. The gun's still falling! Oh, oh how high did the gun... And I wanted to review this film with him, however, obviously we can't do that with the restrictions. And admittedly, it's a bit of a loss because instead of just laughing our asses off at everything that happened in this movie, this film is actually put together quite a bit better than the last Resident Evil film. Once again, directed by Paul W.S. Anderson. Yeah, it doesn't really hold your hand in terms of trying to make sense of anything that's going on. I don't even know if it's relevant to the actual source material. From what I've heard, it's not. If anything, maybe the costume design and the weapon design I might be, but other than that, it is totally nonsensical in terms of its plot. Mila gets caught in some sort of time warp thingamabobby and gets thrown into this alternate dimension, and all of her comrades get killed, like, right off. Like, Freaking T.I. has this weird spider thing that eats him, which actually was pretty creepy. There's a lot of horror elements in this film, at least in the beginning, and it's kind of harkening back to Paul W. S. Anderson's sort of go gory days with Event Horizon, because if this movie is PG-13, he pushes it quite considerably, the beginning of the film, with how many people die at the beginning. But again, there's also nonsensical stuff. For instance, Mila gets stabbed by the giant spider thing, and it puts her to sleep, and then she wakes up, and then she gets stabbed again, and then she wakes up, in a cocoon thing. And now, while this movie really doesn't make much sense in terms of its source material, in terms of what it's talking about, it really just throws you into this thing without any sort of brace, which is not very much unlike Paul W. Sanderson. The idea of plot to him has not been exactly a priority for his films. I swear, since his version of The Three Musketeers, I'm not joking, I don't think he's had a plot that solid since that movie, and it's literally one of the most retold stories of all time. If he could somehow screw the plot up of that movie, I would have been amazed. Especially with the last three Resident Evil films, the plot was so poorly put together. I swear, in Afterlife and Retribution, there was no plot, and in the final chapter, there barely was. Speaking of the final chapter, the editing in that film is fucking atrocious. It's some of the worst editing I've seen in a long time. It goes back to that Taken 3, 8 jillion cuts on one thing. This film thankfully does not have that. If anything, it actually has some pretty decent cinematography. Sometimes, like, it, it, it's above average in terms of what we've seen from Anderson's. I wasn't having a migraine from all the cuts that were happening. I was able to actually see and confirm what was happening on the screen in front of me. Heck, even when they're doing the corny looking wire work with flying in the air, it actually didn't look that bad. It reminded me of that terrible Attack on Titan movie and it looked a lot better than that movie. Is this the point where Western cinema is starting to kind of emulate Japanese anime a lot better now? I don't know. As for the cast, I don't know. Ron Perlman wears an incredibly funny looking wig, but he doesn't do much. Tony Jaa is in this, but he doesn't have really much dialogue aside from chocolate. It was shot in South Africa, which makes use of all the really cool and unique terrain. The CG effects that add in, as well as the monsters, of course, isn't poorly done. If anything, it's actually pretty well done, considering this movie must have not had that much budget. And of course, the movie ends with a cliffhanger in terms of a franchise setup. Overall, it's not a poorly put together movie. I guess in terms of the Paul W.S. Anderson scope, it's kind of formulaic. If anything, it's actually very formulaic. The soundtrack, at first I thought wasn't bad until I started to get a lot of vibes that the guy was ripping off the Tron Legacy soundtrack, and there's a lot of moments where it sounds like verbatim. Uh, otherwise, though, I feel that Monster Hunter is quite forgettable, though. It's, it's not great, it's not bad, but... I'm never gonna see this again unless I watch it with Pedram. So in the end, I'm gonna give Monster Hunter a 2 out of 7. I would've almost given it a 3 because the visuals and the pacing and the editing are pretty well done. But honestly, this movie doesn't have much going for it. It's barely got any story going on. Of course, it's got a Sky Tower bullshit in it. Anderson's just like, 
How many tropes can I tick off? How many tropes can I tick off? Anyways, guys, that's all from me. I hope you enjoyed the review. If you did, leave a like, and if you're interested in more, subscribe. Otherwise, see you guys next time. Thanks for watching the video. My name is Nitz, and you might remember me from the animated cult classic TV show, Undergrads. It's been a while, but I'm happy to say the click is finally getting back together in an all new movie, thanks to a successful Kickstarter campaign. But we are still asking for your support. To see any and all updates about the upcoming Undergrads movie, be sure to check out and like the Bring Back Undergrads Facebook page. And with any luck, we'll see you guys soon.